The following is a production of Medfield TV. Superintendent Schools of Medfield, for those of you that um, don't know me, I know we have over 150 folks from other districts here, so welcome to Medfield. Um, welcome to the professional development event formerly known as Digital Learning Day. Um, today is our seventh DLD, and we're excited for an outstanding day of collaboration, reflection, risk taking, and learning. This day could not be possible without this amazing group of folks that make up our DLD committee. And I want to just really recognize them, ask them to stand, and give them a huge thank you. So, Neil Sonnenberg, Neil, please stand up. As you can imagine, a ton goes into playing this day. So we appreciate their leadership, dedication, creativity. Um, they just do an awesome job for this. So I really appreciate that. I um, also want to acknowledge our technology staff, our office staff, and our food service staff. They've done an incredible amount of work behind the scenes to make this day successful. So thank you to all those folks again. So seven years ago, DLD was an, was an in-house uh, PD with the goal of, of giving our in-house folks um, and early adopters in technology an opportunity to showcase their tech-based learning strategies. It was really a true homegrown professional development event. Today we have over 100 learning sessions, educators from over 50 school districts, and over 150 attendees outside of Medfield. The growth of this day is truly amazing, and it, it's to all of you, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm so proud of these early adopters and so many other Medfield teachers and leaders that continue to push themselves outside of their comfort zone. These educators know that the way we've always done it is really comfortable. They also know that the way we've always done it stifles innovation and also can ruin potential. Today you will meet some of these educators that I'm describing. Melinda Lohan, Julian Lowry, and Nat Vaughn from Medfield. Peter Zajac from Norton, Raina Freeman from Mansfield, Friedman from Mansfield, and Jez Savanovich from Natick. All will deliver. <laughs> all will deliver inspiring passion pitches. And just as a side note, I did look at the lineup. So we're going to have five folks first, and then we're going to have Nat doing the end. And um, once I figured out that Nat was doing the end, I just want everyone to know that I did notify food service there will be um, dinner provided for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Neil, for making that for us. Um, looking forward to it now. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to thank those six people for really putting themselves out um, and telling their story. We're really excited to hear about your passion, which is, um, and on behalf of everyone, um, thank you for telling your stories. So I think we're ready for our video. Uh, I think this is a Chris Foss uh, production. Chris, <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming and have an awesome DLD. I appreciate it.
no walls, only the bricks. My supposition, my success with Thank you. 
finger, your index finger that is, and point to someone that's sitting down and let them know that next year they're going to present and you're going to actually get to enjoy the day. Thank you so much for presenting today because without you we don't have a conference. In addition to these numbers, we also have 65 people here today who are brand new to DLD, so we wanted to also make sure we welcome you. We have over 50 districts and organizations represented here today, and uh, it's just going to be an amazing day of learning. So, Dr. Marsden already spoke about how far we've come as a district in terms of DLD, and the thing this year was, what's your D? And the reason we came up with that is, seven years ago, we really were focusing on the digital component, and now we're, we've really transitioned into more about designing your learning. Our, our schedule has changed, so there's a lot more to do with wellness, um, social-emotional learning, and things that just evolve around good teaching and good learning, and not so much focus on the D. So when you think about what's your D, think about designing your day and discussing and dabbling and taking deep dives today into the different sessions that you go to. So to help you get the most of the day, there's a couple things that are kind of new and exciting. So some of you may have seen my good friend Matt Hall, I don't know if Matt are in here now. Um, he was in, uh, um, inflating kind of a big bouncy house out in the, uh, the foyer. Um, if you haven't seen that, that's a, a shared studios portal. By the time you leave here today, that will be up and running. I'm not going to give you all the secrets of what it is, but make sure you stick your head in there sometime today. It will be a live chat with Amon Jordan uh, at 11 o'clock. Um, and um, I was just told this morning on the way in, he was able to connect starting at uh, 8.30 this morning with Iraq. So uh, when you get a second, poke your head in there. You'll be in there for live chats during those times, and just poke your head in any other time to see what it's all about. Uh, thank you to the Andover Public Schools for letting us borrow it and uh, to borrow him as well. Um, as I look around today, I see all these stressed out faces. You had to sleep an hour later today. You have all this catered food, and you have no students. So I can see how stressed out you all are. We have a solution for you. Thanks to the MIIA, and I have no idea what that stands for, but thank you to them. They have provided two um, licensed massage therapists who are going to be in room 114 today from 10 to 1 o'clock. Okay, it's first come, first serve. There are 10 minute massages. So um, you'll have to get in line behind, I don't know, probably the DLD committee. But other than that, between 10 and 1, room 114, uh, go get yourself a um, uh, massage. Okay, one other big change this year is uh, we've kind of changed the way that you're going to access slides from your presenters. The presenters have done an awesome job preparing for today, and one of the things they've done is given us, most of them have given us all their slides ahead of time. So rather than going to a session and not knowing how to access it, everything's in one central location. So within SCED, there is a link that says Maps and Slides. When you click on that, you'll be taken to another link that'll take you to an awesome table that um, I was able to create. Thank you to Aaron Fisher from East Bridgewater. Over there, thank you. Um, so all the links are there. You can sort, you can uh, find whatever you need. And just know if you aren't able to attend a session you wanted to go to, you still have access to the slides um, later on today or whenever you want to access them. Hopefully that'll make it easier for presenters and for people attending. Last thing I wanted to mention, our conference is, is a little different. We call it DLD, Design Your Learning Day. If you go to a session and it's just not right for you, like perhaps you got stuck in my session, and you said, you know what, this ain't working because I'm maybe teaching beginner Google Sheets and you're already an expert, let your feet do the talking. It's okay to walk out. Our presenters are big boys and girls. If you do it politely, walk out, go to a session, another session that you were maybe deciding between. This is your day. This is the favorite day of the year for our staff. At least that's what they tell us. At least that's what they tell me. So make sure you go to a session you want to go to. So if you have to walk out of a session, it's okay to do that. Just know that our cooking session and our improv session are both full. So other than that, you can pretty much have free reign to go where you want. So with that said, um, I wanted to introduce the guru of guidance, the queen of the cafeteria, Ms. Stephanie Workley. Good morning. Um, welcome. I know as you get to a conference and everybody kind of settles in, everybody starts to wonder about their two basic needs, Wi-Fi and food. So I'm here to talk about food. I have been a part of this committee now. This is my second year, and this year I've been working very closely with the food services staff that I would just like to thank. They've been working very hard on preparing today's uh, food for everybody, the snacks, the lunches, and so forth. So um, thank you to them. But I hope everybody had a chance to grab some breakfast on the way in over in the uh, first floor lobby. Um, if you did not, when we leave the auditorium, there will still be food out and available for you to grab a bite to eat um, on your way to your first session. 
During the, the sessions, um, between sessions one and two, and then again in three and four, there will be snacks available for you. So if at the end of your session you're feeling a little hungry before moving on to the next session, please stop by um, one of the four locations. Um, there will be snack food available. Um, one of the most important things I want to talk about, though, briefly is lunch. Um, several years ago, for those of you that have been here for all seven years, um, we used to feed everybody in the cafeteria at the same time, and it didn't go smoothly. So we have lunch split up into four locations. So when you're in your session two um, DLD session this morning, on the whiteboard, we went around last night and posted where you are to pick up your lunch. So we divided it out. Everybody's already put in their lunch choice. So we'll have um, lunches set up in the cafeteria, the library, the um, upstairs foyer or the senior lounge for those of you that work at NHS, um, and then the first floor lobby right side outside of the guidance department. So really make note when you're in that session where to pick up your lunch so that way everybody can grab their lunch and go. If you um, sign up for a vegan or a gluten-free lunch, those lunches need to be picked up in the cafeteria. Um, you should have gotten an email from me um, just a couple days ago about your lunches there as well. Um, once you grab your lunch, feel free. You can eat in the cafeteria, you can eat in the library, you can eat in the classroom, you can eat in the hallway, go outside, whatever you'd like to do. Um, just grab your lunch and go. You're welcome to stop by the library, um, check out the makerspace, and sign up for some med camp opportunities as well. Um, as I said, there will also be some snacks between sessions three and four, so again, if you're hungry, um, we will have um, waters and coffee out all day as well in the library and in the main foyer. So if you need anything related to food, um, I'm your person to go to. So next, um, Ann Lodge is going to talk about if you have other questions that need some help during the day. Good morning, everyone. We're excited to be here with you. Um, and we're actually also excited to have a number of student volunteers joining us today, even though they could have been sleeping in and had the day off. We have about 25 to 30 different students from the high school and middle school who will be here this morning to help us navigate the building, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the building, assist with any technology needs that we might be able to um, find during the day, and also take some pictures and do some filming throughout the course of the day. So you should be able to identify those individuals. Hopefully they're wearing their Medfield blue and they'll have big name tags on. They will be navigating throughout the building over the course of the day. Some of them will be stationed in your sessions to help with any technology needs. But should you have any needs at any different point during the day, whether it's trying to find something or with technology, please poke your head out into the hallway. We should have hallway floaters. We'll have students directing you to the lunch sessions and to all of your sessions throughout the course of the day. Um, if for whatever reason you aren't able to find someone in your particular hallway, I'd say just wait a minute, someone will be around, they will be floating throughout the course of the day. So thanks to our student volunteers, you'll see them a little bit later. Um, and now I'm gonna bring up Kate Jones to share some more information. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm here to tell you how to get your D on in the LMC, where you can um, Find your D to design, dabble, and discover. Explore the Maker Space Playground where you can do hands-on activities such as whimsical poetry, 3D printing, virtual reality, and so much more. We do have a long time for lunch, so there, it's open all day for you to drop in. Um, we're lucky to have the MIT Edgerton Maker Space and the fabulous Watertown Fab Lab here along with the Blaker Maker Space and the Medfield K-5 Maker Spaces. Um, in our second session, we will have a student steamer showcase. So come and meet our student um, volunteers, our scientists, engineers, and problem solvers are here to uh, demonstrate and share their passion for learning. Um, I think it's going to be a great day, and welcome, everyone. Thank you. I'm going to quickly talk about our awesome passion pitch people um, because this is brand new for us and we're really excited um, to welcome our six special guests. Um, our goal for this year was to kind of shake DLD up, um, so more than just changing the word digital to design, 
we wanted to make sure we had some other moments of impact. And we thought the, the keynote speaker um, is, is wonderful and there's a lot to be said for that. But we wanted to start recognizing some greatness from within. We have some really amazing educators in Medfield and around Medfield, um, all of you in this room. And why have people come in from, um, you know, from outside of the trenches, so to speak, when we have people living in the trenches, <laughs> pouring their heart and soul out to what they do, that we deserve to hear from. So we're hoping this is going to be like a nice little trend um, of recognizing greatness from within. So, um, sorry. All right, so the other thing we want to do is model risk taking and what better way to do that for our students. Um, and it's also how I kind of package the deal for these six. <laughs> Sweet and said, that, how could you say no when you're asking your students to take risks every day? Little did they know that I'd be stalking them since December. It was late December that I first reached out. So we've done Google Hangouts, lots of emails, and on top of their already busy lives, um, they've all been thinking about this since December. So that's pretty impressive. It's been a long, long road, much longer than um, we even released any information out of social media about. Um, so just like I told them back in December, here were the rules, just so you know. Um, because these are not people who have all the time in the world to be writing keynote speeches. Um, you know, they were doing report cards and conferences and special ed meetings and parent emails on top of life and holidays and all the other things that we all do. Um, so this is, this is all we gave them. There's no right way to do this whatsoever. So they've all kind of run with it in their own way. Just speak from your heart. Um, we said it's going to be like a TED talk or um, an Ignite talk. So you're not going to go on and on and on, which is almost more pressure because it's the, the 10 minute window is like, it sounds good at the time, but it, that's, it's a really hard window. I mean, we've already gone over a CLD committee and we had it like timed yesterday. Um, the other thing we said is pro athletes get to walk out to music, so I really felt it was important to show and set the tone for all of you that if you can walk into your schools every morning with some kind of anthem, pick it, because we are superstars and we should be treated like that, and especially these six, so they got to pick their, their music, which was fun. Hopefully everything will work. Um, and that's the other thing is to give us, um, you know, this is all new, so Nothing is going to go perfectly. I'm going to be trying to run things up here. They're all mic'd up as of this morning. We have backup plans, but just be prepared. We're going to do our best to get through this um, and be supportive because they are in the trenches and they just like you have to wake up tomorrow and go back to work. So um, this is a big ask. Um, so I just want to send a, a huge thank you to them and um, and just remind you, you know, that let's start placing value in each other. Um, because if you look around the room, we could have picked any one of you to do this, and who knows, maybe next year we will. So. So as we introduce all of our passion pitchers today, we have asked for a special somebody to come up and provide the introduction for each of them. So I would like to start by introducing Sarah Isaacson to the podium. Good morning. I'm Sarah Isaacson and I grew up in Medfield. I teach fourth grade at Dale Street School in Medfield and I will be introducing Melinda Lohan, a high school history teacher. Melinda Lohan has been teaching at Medfield High School for 13 years in the Social Studies Department. She lives in Boston with her husband, son, and two dogs. While she loves spending time with family, teaching, and learning about history, she balances her time by binging on television so bad that it is good. Yeah. Melinda's priorities and passions have changed over the years, but all of those choices had led her to talk about the topic of time at this year's DLD, because timing is everything. I'm not only a fourth grade teacher in Medfield, I'm a product of the Medfield school system. I'm not only a product of the Medfield school system, I was fortunate enough to have Melinda for history in my junior year and as a soccer coach throughout high school. Melinda, or Lohan as we referred to her, was more than a coach. She witnessed my highest highs and supported me through some of my lowest lows. 
One thing that strikes me about Melinda is just how much she cares about the people she works with, teaches, and coaches. Throughout high school, when my teammates and I arrived at school, the first place we went to was her classroom. During lunch, you would find us in her room. After school, if you were looking for us, you guessed it, we were doing our homework and hanging out in her room. Why? Because she was that teacher, that coach, that person that genuinely cared. I still remember sitting in her room while she made a t-chart on her whiteboard to compare the two colleges I was choosing between. At the time, choosing a college was the most important decision in my life, and she was right there guiding me along the way. To this day, I still go to Melinda for advice in so many areas of my life. Teaching, coaching, even outfit choices. <laughs> While public speaking is not my forte, when I was asked to introduce Melinda, I couldn't say no. She is the role model that I hope to be for my students, and I could not be more proud to introduce Melinda Lohan. Pretend that I'm not out of breath from walking upstairs and even bubbling the brook last night. I'm just anxious um, to talk to everybody. Thank you to Sarah for introducing me. This is um, a really incredible honor, and um, I'm looking forward to doing this if it moves. Love you! Yes! It's not moving, Carrie. I'm gonna start the music again. Ruining my timing, which is what my thing's about. <laughs> it doesn't matter, it's just the other one is open. All right, so um, we walk into Beyonce because this is an iconic pop culture picture of Beyonce exposing her pregnancy for the first time after an epic mic drop and opening a corset. And when I shared with my students that I was also expecting this summer, my timing was not the same. I did not share it with the world all at once. I told first period, and by the time five minutes into class was over, the entire school knew through a group text. And what I thought was going to be my news to share was throughout the day asking me, you know, Mrs. Lohan, I'm not going to do well on that test tomorrow, and I'm just going to cry like a baby. And, oh, I dropped my water bottle. Did my water break? And I'm like, not your news to share, but yes, I am expecting the spring. But Beyonce had the perfect timing, and I, unfortunately, did not. And I'm, although Medfield High School and Medfield Public School did not hire the Carters to present to you today, you are stuck with the Lohans. And this is our reality. Um, despite the picture, my two and a half year old crying on Mother's Day that he doesn't want to spend time with me, and my husband sitting in front of the oven looking and watching his browsy bites cook after we just watched it on Shark Tank the night before. This is who we are, right? And so you're probably wondering why they would ask me to come up here and present to you. We have dance parties, we love watching television, we embarrass our child on a daily basis singing theme songs to his favorite songs. Literally, is like, Mama, stop. Um, at two, so it's going to be awesome. Um, but there's going to be every minute that we spend together is what I find to be most valuable, right? Our time is what's most important to us, and the people that we spend it with it, are the people that we're fighting for every day, right? They're the people that we're hoping for every single minute we'll have another chance. So when Neil asked if I would present, um, I was obviously freaking out, and when he told me who the other people were, I did the only natural thing but trolled their Twitters <laughs> to find out who else I would be presenting with. And when you look at this, the 5,000 people isn't even gone, right? You would think that'd be gone, it's not gone. Um, and they have these amazing, amazing networks. 
And then there's me, and I've actually lost a follower since I named this guy. <laughs> I'm down to one six and three, so if you could help me out, that would be great. Um, I realized when they took out the digital and DLD, you all were going to be stuck with me. So thank you to the team for asking us to speak today, and thank you for the administration for continuing teacher on PD because I do think it's really, really valuable. So who are you listening to today? Um, I, like they said in my introduction, I'm a 13-year veteran here in the social studies department. Um, I'm a planner. I'm somebody who's obsessed with time. I know what I'm doing already on June 11th. It's in my book. It's on my slides. I've already made my plan. I'm super conscious of time, and I strongly believe that time is one of our most precious assets as educators. It's a resource that we can never get back, and also one of the ones that's most frequently wasted. Sometimes we think we're superheroes and can do it all, but we can't even get to the bathroom. We overcommit ourselves, parking, hacking every piece of wisdom that we have into a class period, and other times we wish it away to get through a tough day or get another opportunity closer to a vacation. And while the minutes and hours are invaluable, it's the timing. <coughs> it's the way we use those minutes that makes or breaks student learning. It's not about the number of hours that they are in their classroom, but the choices we make in order to take advantage of those minutes that have the most impact. Um, how we deliver our curriculum, whether we stop to address the elephant in the room that's obviously going to get us off topic, having those tough conversations to promote learning outside of our content, and knowing when all those things are over, they're hoping that they're the most effective, that they've made the most change. By the end of the year, I will have 164 students, right, with semester courses. A few juniors were stuck with me twice a day, so I will round it out about 155. But it's a lot of kids. It's a lot of opportunities in order to hopefully make a change. I do, we do, we have 180 opportunities to impact a student's day, positively or negatively. And it's an investment in our time, their time, and proper timing that leads us to this success. So as you can see, some of those courses are rather unique with sociology and behavioral studies. We can have a lot of really tough conversations in those, in those classes. So I'm giving more opportunities to kind of address things that maybe in a normal core curriculum class, they don't come up. Um, so we use a lot of post-its in order to get feedback and have an understanding of what they're thinking, how they're feeling, so that we talk about the comment rather than the student when we discuss some of these ideas. So these are some post-its from some of my students. And if some of that information on the board is jarring for you, that is what we deal with every single day. These are the things that they're thinking, that they're saying, and we're just giving them avenues sometimes to have these conversations. So I think if you were to all, just by looking at faces, I don't think I have to have you raise your hands before Marsden packs up my classroom when he's done talking. <laughs> These things are what we talk about in our classrooms, right? We have in sociology a race and gender unit, which probably is one of my most important units that I talk about. But if I do it in September or October, they're not, they don't trust me enough. They don't trust each other enough to say what they're truly thinking and feeling. And if I do it in May, my seniors are so checked out that they've got one foot out the door that they don't care what they think or say, and that usually leads us into even more trouble. So we have to time it right. When I do this is based on the kids I have in front of me, and sometimes I'm doing it period five, but period seven isn't ready to have the conversation. So this conversation on the left-hand side, which is, while very jarring, is about to provoke some of the best learning that I have in my classroom because we're gonna talk about it. This is something that they're going to hear at some point in their lives. Whether they think it, someone else thinks it, their college roommate, whatever the case might be, they're going to eventually have this conversation. Our country is changing, and we need to have these conversations. Even at a younger age, because when we miss those opportunities, this is what we're getting at the high school level. They haven't had a place to kind of let this information out and to talk about it, and hopefully in the future say it a little bit more eloquently. Um, and on the right-hand side, it's about the timing of those flip comments that we make that to us is just a millisecond. It's just something that is passing to us, but to the two Asian students who are sitting in class, when you call them the wrong name, it makes them feel like they're not worth something. And to most of us, it's September, and we just made a mistake. But this comment was made when this student was a freshman, and they still held on to it as a senior. And it's somebody who, I don't know who the teacher is, but it's something that really, really struck them and stuck with them. So the timing of this stuff, thinking about how we talk to our students and what we say to them, is truly invaluable. Right? On the left-hand side, some of our other students have talked to us about the need and the timing that they have, what they consider to be their time, how they get feedback, what their reflection is, um, how important all that is to them. 
So the students we have sitting in front of us are not the same kind of kid. We can complain about it all we want, but times are different and our jobs are different. Students have very little control over their lives. They're driven by fear, unnecessary competition, tutors, coaches, advisors, driving hours, family, friends, cell phones, you name it, it's impacting them. Um, and all of them are dictating what they do, when they do it, and when it has to be done by. One of my juniors said the other day, I just feel like I'm constantly running out of time, and it makes me angry because I feel like I'm missing out on life. She's bright, she has a balanced schedule, She's one of those, she plays one sport, doesn't have an SAT tutor, never takes her phone out during class, She's doing everything that we're asking her to do, yet she still feels overwhelmed. She still feels like she's missing out and that she has very little choice. Sometimes I feel like that as an adult as well. I uh, make plans to grade and lesson plan and get things off my checklist. And then weeks like this happen where the term ends, you have a professional day, I'm losing my junior smart for an amazing college experience, and I have seven different reports to fill out, teacher reports, weekly reports, 504 initiatives, SST, some of them take 20 seconds and some of them take 20 minutes. We make plans with our time, sometimes they're disrupted. Um, but it's about those 120 students that I have each semester that I know I'm gonna hear a lot of strategies on how I can help them today, how I can be more effective and more efficient and give them better feedback and individualize it and make sure it directly impacts their learning. But again, that's something that takes time and you have to figure out what's worth it and what can you do in order to also keep your own sanity. So over the years, I've had to find ways to keep my own sanity and also still do right by kids. So there's a few changes that I'd like to share with you that maybe will help you in your own classrooms, and maybe they won't. Um, one of the first things is, I only ask my students to do things out of school that are necessary and can be done without my help. Everything else, I have tried to build time for that inside my classroom. I don't fill a class period in order to go bell to bell. We cover what needs to be done, and then students are able to choose their own adventure. So for example, in the cold war the other day, I've got my military history kids listening to lectures on, from college professors. My social kids are looking at advertising on gender. Um, then I've got present day articles that they're looking at. And then you just have those kids that need a break. So we build that in sometimes, and I have them make choices. We call it choose your own adventure. Um, choosing your own adventure to do nothing every single day is not an option. But the goal is that I'm building enough curiosity throughout my period that the last 10 minutes they want to learn more. They're expanding on their knowledge. Does every kid rise to the challenge? Absolutely not. But most of them do because they're genuinely interested in what we're talking about um, because we try to use that time wisely. The last change I've made, which really lends itself to a flipped classroom, is a 40 minute study period before every assessment. It's unstructured, which some of you are probably thinking is kind of lazy because it's not requiring a lot of planning on my part but it forces the students to take ownership over their learning. They have to use time management, take advantage of the time they're given, and only, the only rule is they have to do something for history class. They create study guides, ask questions, complete makeup work, and it's a good time for me to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with my kids that when you have a class of 25, is next to impossible on a daily basis. So um, they have to put in the time in order to get out of it what they need. I'm not suggesting by any means that I have the answers or that I am the person who should be telling you how to run your classroom. But these are choices that I've made throughout my career that have helped me find my time, helped me with my timing, and change my curriculum to hopefully help my students, but also help myself in the same way. Like we said before, this job is different, and it's important that we not only take care of our kids, but we also take care of ourselves. So I'm hoping that my takeaways for you is that it's not worth your time, it's probably not worth theirs. So if you're not gonna check something that took them an hour, why make them do something that's gonna take them an hour, right? If we're gonna, not saying you have to invest the same hour, but if it's not worth your time to look at it, is it actually worth their time to do it? Um, when you aren't sure if you're making a difference, odds are you probably are, so be thoughtful. Um, having these conversations, I had a couple of students a couple of years ago um, hanging outside of Maria's office, which is the athletic trainer's office, and there were two kids, they were fooling around, and one kid took another kid's hat off his head, and he ran down the hall, and he just screamed out, just another black kid stealing, in front of a hundred kids in the basement. That has a huge impact, and I had a choice. I could get all sociological Mrs. Lohan on them and go lecture up and down about why you can't do that and the impact it has on that kid, or I have a choice to have a side conversation with them later have, and hopefully have them listen to me because I didn't have a relationship with those kids. That conversation actually came up in sociology four years later that I had pulled the kid aside and we had had a side conversation rather than ripping him up and down in front of his peers. 
which I've also done and has been a big mistake and I've had to apologize for because you get sometimes caught up in the heat of the moment. But thinking about how thoughtful we are with how we address our kids, I think is really important, the timing of those conversations, even when they're tough. And that we embrace the importance of timing, even when it disrupts your plans. Sometimes things get off the rails, sometimes you might lose an entire class period, but if that conversation, that topic is important, that we build it in and we make sure that we have the time for our students to learn and grow the way that they need. And that is all. about the time that we spent at work, or spend at work, I should say. Um, I'm curious to hear more about time outside of work and how we all manage that. And I'm gonna put a plug in for the med camp this afternoon. If you wanna come talk about self-care and timing of, for the educator, please come by the library. Um, next, I would like to introduce to the stage um, Neely Bartley to present our next presenter. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, good morning. Um, Melinda, before I begin, I just want to say, you just got a new Twitter follower. You are awesome. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> so um, my name is Neely Barley, and I am a tech teacher and integration specialist at Wilson Middle School in Natick. And I am lucky enough to work with uh, Jed Stefanowitz, our next passion pitcher. So as Natix Innovation Fellow, Jed provides job embedded PD and instructional coaching for academic technology. Jed aims to engage and build staff and student capacity with digital tools while keeping the focus on practice over product. As an educator, speaker, and blogger, Jed shares his passion for effective tech integration to transform teaching and learning, creating digital learning environments and experiences that are meaningful, memorable, and measurable. Check out his blog at Stefanowitz class at blogspot.com. So I read that word for word, and now I'm just going to try to speak to you from the heart like all of these fabulous people are doing today. So Jed was always someone that I knew of and admired greatly, but it wasn't until a couple of mass cues ago that he caught my attention. Yeah, it's mass cue. That's right, Rena. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> And like from across the room, he sort of looked at me and he was like, we need to talk. Do you remember that, Jed? Okay. Yeah. And so to be honest with you, I was like a little scared, but mostly I was just thrilled that somebody wanted to talk to me and especially that it was Jed Stefanowitz. And luckily, a month later at NILS, our Natick Learning Day, we had the opportunity to talk. And not only that, I was able to attend his session. And it was there that I saw his passion for teaching and learning come to life, and it was also this same passion that helped draw me to Natick. Now, I am lucky enough to actually work in the same district with Jed, and we have been able to, as Jed says, collabo. I'm not sure that anybody else uses that for collaboration, but he does. Um, in every email, everything. Um, we've been able to collabo many, many times. And in fact, he has taken over some of my fifth grade classes, which has been great because I didn't really have to do anything. But I was really able to focus on observing him. And I learned so much from this passionate leader. Whether it's coding, makey makey, uh, video creation, green screen, a digital badge system, PBL, his famous um, digital tool menu that he is bringing to staff and students. He is all about empowering the people around him. He is all about empowering kids. He is all about empowering students. And in fact, um, connection is a big deal with him, right? Our district hashtag, hashtag is relationships matter. And Jed brings this to life every day. So Jed, I'm going to be you for just a second. Is that OK? So he does this little thing every time he comes into a new class. And it goes something like this. Hello, my name is Mr. Stefanowitz. It rhymes with Bananowitz, but please don't call me Mr. Bananowitz. And even like, as you can imagine, my fifth graders are completely sold. He is also an amazing colleague. Jed, he's about the only person I know that will do this, <coughs> will literally sit down and listen to me for like 45 minutes straight, which I know sounds agonizing. And then he'll give me like the world's greatest advice. He is always aiming to inspire people around him. And if it's not face to face, it's through his Jed talks, which I highly recommend reading. A passionate leader who is willing to do whatever it takes to lift people up and get them trying new things that seriously rock their world. Please help me introduce 
the one and only Jed Stefanowicz. Really, that was like hearing my own melody. Thank you. Wow. That's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I remember uh, a couple of masks ago saying we got to talk and it being a really awkward moment. So thanks for reminding me. More like a total creep off. Um, so that was a nice surprise. Thanks, Neely. Uh, and it's not just because you're the only other person from Native here. I know it. I believe it. Uh, and also thanks to uh, Medfield DLD committee, I really appreciate it. Um, it's, I've been coming to this for years, and to be able to be on the stage and talk to you is really awesome. Um, and Melinda, thank you, you're a tough act to follow. So uh, when you talk about a passion pitch, we see, we feel, we hear your passion. You're a tough act to follow. So is George Carlos. But you know, for the six of us, he was like our opening act, right? So he opened for us, is how I like to think about it. Um, so what I, what I do want to talk about is what I like to call a theory of educational relativity. It's kind of a stretch, kind of a reach, and if it doesn't work, you can blame Carrie, because she said it, right? There's no rules. Um, and since Melinda told us a little bit about her personal background, um, I'm Jeb Stefanowitz. It rhymes with Bananowitz. Don't call me Mr. Bananowitz, please. It wants to. Um, so I have been for, here we go, this year and last year, Natick's uh, Innovation Fellow, elementary, K-4, to but I kind of added preschool, kind of added some fifth grade, and um, stretching that a little bit. Before that, uh, I was a third grade teacher for 22 years, and then before that, I was a child. So I've kind of done one thing, uh, and I've done it for a long time. In my role as Natick's Innovation Fellow, uh, the title I decided or kind of rolled or slid into was the role of Digital Learning Coach. And it is my firm belief that the role of a coach is to constantly shift the conversation from products to practices. There's always new stuff, right? But it's got to be about how we use that stuff. So I do appreciate the invitation to be here. Dr. Marsden started us off great. Uh, the way we've always done things is comfortable, but the way we've always done things is stifles innovation. That's what this whole passion pitch is about. Switching up how information is presented, shif shifting how we share our interests, our engagement, our passions. Um, and then we also heard, maybe equally as important, that the groove is in the heart. So said D-Light. So D-Light, I do think I found your missing D. Might have been D-Light all along. So this passion pitch, my passion is just finding ways to ignite teaching and learning with technology, without technology, and to kind of remind us of something George told us last year, and this is really what started my journey out of the classroom or differently or just slightly alongside the classroom, is to never hold a learner back based on what you don't know. And that's huge. That was a punch in the gut for me to really think about what, what role I play, what role we all play for our students. So what is the secret? Right? What don't we know? What is it that we don't know that can transform teaching and learning? What is the secret formula for engaged and effective teaching and learning? Well, is there a secret formula? There's one important formula. There it is, the biggest one ever. So as a, as a proper teacher, I'll steal an idea, claim it as my own, and tweak it my own way, and <laughs> do it the way I think makes sense. So E equals MC squared. How the heck does that relate to today? How does this fit my passion? Well, we're going to break it down. This is what I call that theory of educational relativity because it's about perspective, but also relatability because it's about connection, as Neely was talking about. And it's about responsibility, right? We're all in this together. It's a shared, it's a common experience. We all share these kids from the moment they arrive till the moment they leave. And that's why we prepare and we work on these portraits of a graduate. And we want to follow that trajectory so that the diploma at the end isn't just a receipt of what they've done, but it's now their license toward the next step. So breaking down the E equals MC squared, E is the experience. 
That's what we want to be generating. We want to create these experiences. And these experiences, to keep with the ease, the objective is to get empowerment, engagement, empathy. These are the skills we want to build. They're not soft skills. They're critical skills. And they're the hardest ones to measure. We know it. No great standardized test yet has found a way to properly measure or show student empowerment, engagement, and empathy. But there's our E. So how do we do it? Well, what I like to talk about, and I think the session that Neely talked about, was a session called Creating Combustible Classrooms. If we want to ignite students' engagement, students' imagination. And this came from when I brought my son to an accepted student's day at a college two years ago. And the college president got up and was talking about, we take our job so seriously, we want to ignite, you know, help students ignite their passion. We want to find what they're interested in. And I thought, this is great. I can't wait. I wish I were going back to college. I wish I could start this journey again. And then I thought, you know what, this sucks. Why is it that they're just getting to college before someone has found the time to ignite their passion, find what they're interested in? And I don't think that's the case, to tell you the truth. But what does it take to ignite that? What do we want to do? How do we create those moments? Well, the classic fire triangle with oxygen, fuel, and heat. The oxygen is that room to breathe. Metaphorically, physically, literally. Our classrooms, our classroom learning spaces, the fuel is a curriculum. Sometimes there's not much we can do about that, but that's what's given to us. That's, the, that's sometimes consumable, but the heat, that's us. That's the moment that ignites that learning. That's what we create. So, the moment, that's the end these moments. How do we create these moments that activate thinking, that engage learning? There go my hands. Well, as nearly read, the, uh, the M's are meaningful, memorable, measurable. When we think back to when we were in elementary school, middle school, high school, those experiences that we remember best, those teachers that we remember best, those moments that we remember, chances are it was when they were meaningful, measurable, and memorable. We can have a great lesson that does any one of those three things. But when those three things intersect, that's the sweet spot. That's the one where you wish your supervisor was observing. That's the one you put in the folder and write a note. Yeah, next year, definitely do this. Stretch it to two. Right? Make it better. That's the one that creates the real, the authentic evidence. That creates the showcase of learning that we want to share and put in our teach point or put in whatever your, your measure might be. Because when you hit it, that's those magic moments. And you wish you don't want the bell to ring. So, how do you create those moments? Well, we keep hearing, and this is not to dog any of these, but sometimes there's an influx of being told how to teach like someone else. And the message in any of these is great. It's to find your passion, find your spark, right? But sometimes it can be discouraging. It would be tough to be a brand new teacher right now to be constantly being told how to teach like someone else, or teach like this, or teach like that. When really, if you pick one, dive into it, and then are reflective. And that's the piece. The reflective piece is what allows us to find our spark and brings us into it. I've learned more of how I don't want to be a teacher by watching and sharing and co-teaching and observing my cooperating teacher a million years ago. You know, that's what you are. It's how, what you don't want to do. So these moments that are meaningful, measurable, and memorable, they are moments in time and space, to get back to Einstein for a minute. Oh, and there was a reason for Frank Sinatra. We'll get there in a minute. But these moments in time and space, and I just saw this on Twitter, and I don't know who said it, but I loved it. The time to wander and the space to wander. Right? Those are our moments in time and space. Not an original. I wish it were. So in this time and space, that's why we, we hear things like blended learning, flexible seating, flipped classrooms, personalized learning. Whatever the initiative, whatever the next revolution that comes along, chances are it's going to be student-centered. And chances are it has to do with both time and space and how we use it. But the variables in there, what in there do we have control? Do we have an effect on? How can we break the structures to explore new instructional depth dimension? Right? The way we've always done it is comfortable, but the way we've always done it stifles innovation. So what can we break? How can we get to that other depth and dimension? Well, in time and space, I'm sure it's happened to us all. We get these wormholes, black holes. You ever find yourself saying something that your teacher said to you 20, 10, 30 years ago? Right? That's a black hole. That's a wormhole. It's like, oh my god, I can't believe I just said that, or I can't believe I'm doing this, or where'd this word search come from? And that can be a vacuum. It can be a life support, and you can feel lost in space. But that depth and dimension, if we keep that focus on 
what we want our students doing, who we want our students to be over what we want them to be doing. That's what keep the keeps the focus on competency and understanding over compliance and completion tasks. Otherwise, we're going to feel like we're lost in you know where, Twilight Zone. So, these moments, whether you're a new teacher, whether you're a veteran teacher, I remember one of the worst pieces of advice, is, advice I ever received was just, you know, fake it till you make it. That felt like a total fraud statement to me, right? Don't fake it till you make it, just make it, and then don't stop improving. Just try it, take risks. Your superintendent told you to this morning. I heard him say it. Just make it, try it, don't stop improving. So what's the deal with these C's? I got a timed out just so it said that line and I could drink the water. So the C's, the C squared, what are the C's? Well, somewhere beyond the C's. We all talk about the four C's. Not as soft skills, again, but the student four C's. Communication, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking. Any activity that activates these C's in our classroom, that's what brings learning to life, and we love it. But I like to think about these as student four C's. And then in our school, though, if we want to see these in kids, we need to create these in our classrooms. The school four C's being culture, compassion, connection, climate. We're not going to see these without that. When those intersect, that's when we're get, we'll get engagement, empowerment. There, the letters are there, I promise. And empathy. And that brings us back to those first three, engagement, empowerment, empathy. But it's when those student-driven Cs and our school Cs, when those intersect, when those coincide, when we are all aligned in what our objectives are, that's when we're going to get that. So how do we do it? Well, we always hear about thinking outside the box. Sometimes you can't. Think inside the box when you have to. We have testing. We have schedules. We have curriculum. We have deadlines. We have evaluation. Think outside the box when you can when you're invited, when you're asked. Rebuild the box when you're able, and recycle the box when it's time. It is up to you. It is up to me. It's up to us. Right? Empowerment. It's not just kid stuff anymore. So that's what I call my theory of educational relativity. Why? Because learning happens at the speed of life. Oh, by the way, at 145, what are you doing? <laughs> I have a session called Clips Quick and QRs. Oh my! And the idea is capturing student process, product, performance, practices with digital media, clips and quick. And then this is my uh, blog, Jed Talks. I thought it was so cool. I thought I was the only guy named Jed who would rip off Jed Talks. <laughs> right? Well, I'm not. So be careful what you search for out there because there's a lot of guys named Jed who have a logo like this or write a blog and it's not all educational. <laughs> So, thank you very much, and I look forward to our day together. students, right? So I'd like to introduce today a student who's going to introduce our next passion pitcher, um, a freshman at Medford High School, Olivia Price. Hello, um, I'm Olivia Price and I'm a current freshman at Medford High School and a past student of Mrs. Lowry. Um, Mrs. Lowry has been an educator for 30 years and has had the privilege of teaching all over the country from LA to Napa Valley to Colorado Springs to Kansas City and to Boston. She is currently proud to be teaching fifth grade at Dale Street School right here in Medfield. Um, Mrs. Lowry is passionate about finding authentic, unexpected ways to include creativity and innovation in her lessons. Mrs. Lowry, I'm oh, sorry, but her main focus is always love of learning, joy of reading, and finding ways to get out of her comfort zone every day. She has enjoyed presenting at many conferences and PEs, but this is her first time presenting to a big audience like this. So today, I guess she found a great way to get out of her comfort zone. 
I remember four years ago when I was in the fifth grade class. I always had a smile on my face in that classroom. My friends and I would spend our free time organizing the classroom. It was our favorite pastime. We would beg her to organize instead of read, and that only worked some of the time. Um, if we weren't organizing our classroom, we'd be found on the carpet trying to solve complicated nine-piece puzzles. Yes, there were only nine pieces, but they were difficult. For some reason, my friends and I bought cow stuffed animals and were always found wearing them on our heads. Eventually, it became a thing in our classroom and more people decided to wear stuffed animals on their head too. At the end of the year, my friends and I got Mrs. Lowry a stuffed cow as well so she could wear one on her head. I made so many new friends that year. Every day, our seats would change. Um, and that's the reason why I believe I made so many new friends, as we were forced to sit next to new people. We learned how we learned new life skills in that classroom, skills that will be helpful for the rest of my life. We learned how to deposit and withdraw money from our class store. We all had our own bank accounts and would receive money on good behavior and other things like that. With the money we earned, we could buy a wide array of things from our class store. I loved being in that classroom. I was stress-free and living my best life. Thank you, Mrs. Lowry, for giving me all of those memories. And thank you for making me feel at home in your classroom. Without further ado, Mrs. Lowry.
So I was thinking, wow, that does not sound like a class I want to be in. <laughs> so I was going to offer him some suggestions. Like, well, what about if you offered you know, some choice in questions? What if you added some technology in your class? Well, he wasn't having it. <clears throat> not at all. And we went back and forth for a while. And I, he finally said, you know, I think we're on opposite ends of this issue. And, you know, at this time, at this point, it was 9 o'clock at night. It was raining like crazy. <clears throat> I made my husband come with me. He's in the background, like, unplugging everything and packing everything up and looking at me like, let's go. So it's okay. Like, I think I'm just going to agree to disagree with you right now. You know, but he didn't leave. <laughs> He's still standing there. And then I'm thinking, I've given you everything I've got, guys. I have nothing else to give you. I am done. And then something in my head, like a little birdie, I don't know, God, somebody gave me this. Because it was like, you know, I know what I want to say to you. I know what somebody needs to say to you. And I really wasn't going to say it, because I think it's kind of mean. But you need to hear this. And this is what I said to him. I said, I can see your passion for my and men. But are your students passionate about mice and men? Do they beat down the door to get to your lessons about mice and men? I mean, that's a challenge, right? Getting kids excited about learning is tough. And sometimes the things that we teach aren't exciting to all kids. I mean, what would you have said to them? So I really reflected on this. I reflected on this all summer. I reflected on this in the fall. And I started thinking, man, I don't want to be like that. Like, I want to be flexible. I want to be open-minded. Um, you know, sometimes I think we need to just throw out everything we do every year and start over. Right? Like, don't get stuck. Don't get stuck doing that. Don't be stuck. They have to answer those questions. Oh, my gosh. I do not want to be like that. So I'm thinking, well, okay, let's look at my, my teaching. What? Is there anything that I'm holding on to? Is there anything that my personal passion is actually getting in the way of my success as a teacher? And I hate to admit it, but there is one thing. One thing, there's something I really don't like, but I know my students do. And I avoid it. And it's that cahooty stuff, that cahoots and the quiz things. And, you know, I just, I just don't like them. I don't like, you know, they make up funny names, and I don't know if those are, like, real names or there's some special meaning into those names. And the kids are all laughing about those names, and I'm not getting it. I don't feel comfortable with that. <laughs> you know what? It gets out of, it gets out of hand, right? I, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't like it. So, but, but, I found a new one on Twitter. <coughs> and this one is uh, made by high school. If anybody knows how to make a quizzy kahooty thing, it's high schoolers. I'm gonna try. So, I joined up. I entered my 25 dull, boring, multiple choice questions on the unit we just finished. I connected to the site. I set the game for 20 minutes. Everybody's ready. Let's go. Hit go and just went. I can't tell you. I mean, I honestly, I still haven't come up with words to describe what happened in my classroom. Except, explosion, <laughs> explosion. Explode with excitement, energy, enthusiasm, engagement, oh my gosh. I would say gleeful learning, gleeful learning. I got goosebumps. I, and I didn't make that up just to get the nice hashtag. I really, really got goosebumps. I'm sure you've had that when you're when that something works really well, a lesson is great, the kids are connected. It gives you goosebumps. I mean, it was exciting. And I didn't even go to the next door teacher and say, are we being too loud? Because we were being too loud. But there was nothing I was going to do about it. Those kids were gone. But it was a learning lab. It was good lab. So watching 21 kids go nuts over multiple choice questions was really unbelievable. And after 20 minutes, we were exhausted. So, here it comes. Can we do that again? Can we do that tomorrow? Can we do that every day? Every day! Put me in the coach. I'm ready. So, you know, these two ex 
experience of really um, heavy thinking, right? And I thought, you know, I think I have a new passion. I think I have a new passion. And these two, the reason I'm sharing these two stories with you today is because they really did make me think <coughs> differently. And it gave me something that I wanted my passion pitch for you today. So my passion pitch. What I discovered, what I want to share, and my new passion. Even though I consider myself a very passionate teacher, my lessons can't be designed around what I like. My passion as an educator has to be connecting with my students and find ways to make learning exciting for them in ways that they connect with. And sometimes that may mean I have to step outside my comfort zone or use tools that I don't like. Matching your lessons with your students' passion is worth every bit of change that you have to make as an educator. When you get those goosebumps, you know you're doing what's best for the kids that sit in front of you every day. Put me in, Coach, because I'm ready. Thank you so much. pictures today. Um, to present our next passion pitch, um, I'd like to welcome to the stage Kara Croft. And I'm not even sure these two ladies actually have ever met each other, but through the power of social media, I know that there's a lot of respect and admiration between the two. So, Carrie, come on up. I'm so honored to introduce Kim Zajac. Kim is a speech language pathologist and audiologist for the Norton Public Schools. She serves as a board member of MassQ. She's co-leader of their special interest group for speech language pathology and special education. Kim is the co-founder of EdCamp Southeastern Mass. She's presented at a variety of conferences, including the MassQ Fall, Fall Conference, MASCD Spring Leadership Conference and New England League of Middle Schools Annual Conference. I know this from Twitter. Kim is a Title S leader, leader committed to leading up with her colleagues and modeling risk taking as an essential element for all educators and all students to live their best life living without limits and learning without limits. Most importantly, Kim is well respected by her peers and much loved by her students. I reached out to her coworkers and they described Kim as an amazing team leader, an amazing team player, a pioneer and a champion for kids. And as we just heard some good music telling us the groove is in our heart, all of us know that the heart of our work is with our students. So I reached out to Kim's speech and language students, and this is what they say. She's funny, she's smart, she's a good problem solver and a great supporter. Out of the mouths of her speech and language students, Mrs. Zajac is super helpful. Mrs. Zajac gives me tips to make me better. Mrs. Zajac is so generous. She really understands me. A very warm welcome to the fabulous Kim Zajac. spending time um, listening and learning at DLB Medfield this year. Um, 
We all know that March is a really long month for all teachers, and here we are uh, four days into April, and you're all here ready to learn, get your learning on, and bring back the best nuggets you can to your classroom for the students that you serve. So the real question right now is, how big is your brain? How many of you in this audience have ever contemplated how brave you are? And what does that mean to you? It might mean different things to different people. Being brave is essential to everyone here in this room today. In fact, this is me being brave right now. Um, <laughs> it's happening. I'm trying to dance around that microphone. It's a little scary. Uh, when I was first asked if I would join the group to present today, my first reaction was, oh my goodness, I am so honored and I would, I would be so pleased to do that. And then about half a millisecond later, um, my immediate thought was, oh my god, how am I going to do that in front of all these people? This is scary. Definitely outside of my comfort zone. <coughs> but clearly, here I am, right? I had that conversation with myself, and I decided to find out. I'm a visual thinker. So these are my notes. So while we're being honest, let's talk about the reality of being a teacher in today's world. It is one of the most multi-dimensional occupations you can come by. Everyone has a different opinion or a different angle, and students are more challenged than ever with how they approach learning and how they apply what they're learning in school to the real world. Some people think teaching is about content, and they're not wrong, but there's so much more to it than content. Inclusive, innovative, and inspiring learning doesn't happen by chance. It doesn't happen by automatic process. It doesn't happen because someone nailed the common core in an amazing lesson like a boss. They happen because somewhere along the way, we decided to step up and be brave. One of the most important steps in this path is understanding the reasons why it's important to you to be brave. And so we ask ourselves two questions. The first being, what is my why? And the second being, what if I didn't do that? What if I didn't follow my why and follow my passion to be brave and try these things? What is it that makes your heart beat faster? What do you see that keeps your engine charged and returning every single day to feed your own brain and to charge your colleagues and your students with the desire to learn more? For some, it might be the smiles. These are my two daughters, Caitlin and Amy. They're 14 and 10. Their smiles are my why every single day for so many reasons. They keep me going. It might be the aha moments, the incidental, I caught you, when you catch one of your students doing something with something they learned in your classroom in real life. That's amazing. That's the connection we want them to make. It drives us to keep going. Or maybe it's seeing your students exercise their voice to be heard as active members of their community. Whatever it is, whatever your why is, hold on to it. Hold on tight, because that's going to be your compass and it's going to be what drives your brain forward, moving on. For me, my why, aside from my two children, of my own, um, my other why, my professional why, is student voice. In life, communication is essential. It's central to everything. Yet, as an SLP, I see that communication and its nuances don't always come easy for everyone. As a result, confidence and brave gets lost in the shuffle. It doesn't always come to the front of everybody's toolbox. And that's hard as a student. So not only is my work to help students to develop skills and strategies to help their communication, but my work is to encourage and support them to find their brave. All students, not just the ones that come to see me for speech and language supports, but all of the students in the community of learning where I work. And how do I do this? I do whatever it takes, right? I do whatever it takes, and I've got to meet them where they're at. So I need to ask them, what do you like? What makes you tick? What are your goals? What's hard for you? What are you scared of? How can we figure this out together? And this is where we take the journey and we commit to just keep swimming, right? We're just going to keep going until we reach our destination, whatever goal that might be. We may need to leverage some clever ed tech tools. We may to use a low tech system to stay organized to keep on our, on our path for accomplishing our goals. We might need to work with a student who maybe typical assessment standards or pro protocols and practices don't work for. We're spending time teaching, they're spending time learning. If what we're doing to measure that learning, to see what they know isn't working for them, we as educators need to be brave enough to think outside the box and try something different. 
We can't just keep on using what we've always done, thinking that all of a sudden something's going to change. We need to change. We need to change our thinking, and we need to change the way that we practice in order to make a meaningful impact and difference. Along that path, we're being brave and we're showing students it's okay to try something new. It's okay to try something you're not sure about. We're not faking it till we make it, like Jed said. We're making it and we're improving it along the way for our students who are at the center of what we do. Because what if we don't? What if we don't do that? What if we don't decide to take that risk? What if we don't decide to think outside of the box? Then we're kind of stuck, right? We're choosing safe and sane over brave and change. So in this day and age, being a teacher takes a lot of courage. Being a change agent takes courage. And everybody is capable. There's a leader lurking in every single one of us. It helps to think of it as almost an opportunity, right? It shouldn't be scary. It's an opportunity to grow. According to George Soros, who was here a year ago, as we heard earlier, um, there are five ingredients to this leadership. There's vision, patience and perseverance, curiosity, knowledgeable leadership, and relationships built on trust. These are the essentials. And it sounds like kind of a crazy long list and it's a little daunting, but you know what? It's really not that bad, and people are counting on us to use them. So what we might ask ourselves is, how am I to lead or be a change agent, right? <clears throat> just me. Well, nobody's just me. We are who we decide to be. Anyone can be a leader. Leadership is title agnostic, right? Titleless leader standing up here in front of you all today scare, but going forward. It's not like we come in the door, right, and they hand you a name tag that says, hello, I am the leader, right? No, we all just decide what we're going to do that day and how we're going to do it. And hopefully, other people are excited to join us in doing it. Being a leader is not about being perfect. It's about being real, having a passion and wanting to do something with it. Being flawed, having passion, having a good intention, is that change risk-taking leader that we all need to find in ourselves. In our district, we look for, uh, we look to our leadership teams as mentors, and we look to our colleagues for support, we look to our students as our why. In combination, we have a scaffolded permission to feel empowerment bestowed upon us to execute a call to action. None of us may have the aim or prowess of Katniss Everdeen, but we understand her why, we understand her flaws, and we understand where her brave came from. We also see how she used it with intention for quest and purpose, even when it meant overcoming the most impossible of circumstances. Courage is a thing inside of us, and if we let it, it will grow. It grows best in an imperfect garden. We must plant the seeds, pull the weeds, and take risks in order to reap the harvest that will bring outcomes beyond our wildest imaginations. In the process of tending to our garden of courage, we must become comfortable with being uncomfortable. From my own experience, I can share that this process is akin to learning how to power through a bar class on Saturday morning. Has anyone here ever taken a bar class? Yeah, it's the epitome of uncomfortable, definitely. Um, you know, and whether we're in bar class or in the classroom or we're in a committee meeting with our colleagues, there are always opportunities to push that envelope forward, to move from the comfort zone to where the magic happens. And that's also where all the good work happens. So if we aren't conquering a challenge, I kind of think we're not really living our lives that well. And here, George Lucas even tells us, you have to find something that you love enough to be able to take risks, jump over the hurdles, and break through the brick walls that are always going to be placed in front of you. And this is so true. We just have to keep swinging. We're going to get there eventually. We might be living on the dark side if we don't do that, which unless you are unleashing your brain at Norton Middle School's eighth grade talent show last year, might not be a good thing. But if you were there and you were doing that, then that's a very good thing because this, what you see here, is teacher leaders modeling. They're modeling risk taking, they're modeling creative expression, they're modeling having a presence in community, having voice and choice. None of us here are professional dancers, but we decided it was important enough to us to grow our community and connect with the students we teach, to get on stage and be power troopers. We even had our principal join us, Darth Vader. It was awesome. The kids loved it. 
So two things we always want to encourage in our students, voice and choice, risk-taking and leadership is imperative. Learning to listen, trading fear for flexibility, and adopting an appetite for adaptability is enough to bring the courage, the comfort, and the clarity to our grasp. With these tools in hand, we can begin to design and grow our rig. We can channel our courage to make just noticeable changes, to yield just noticeable differences that add up to big impacts. Not all brave needs to be shown in grand gestures. It's the little things that matter a lot, too. So the photo in the lower left shows my work leading up to today's cash and pitch. Okay, I've already shared with you that this has been a scary process for me. It's totally outside my comfort zone. I do not usually speak off the cuff like this clearly. Okay, you can see there's a stream of index cards strewn across the floor, but each of them holds words and sketches that were a part of the design process for this talk that I am delivering today. Each index card makes small noticeable contributions to what became the slides that I made. And I can assure you that with each letter and each pen stroke, I flexed my brain in pursuit of a messy word, word, message worthy of sharing with you today. In taking risks and learning from local leaders in my PLN, I now see that through risk taking I'm able to be brave and live my best life. Without limits, really anything is possible, and I want that. I want endless possibilities, and I want that for each of you here today. Neely Bartley is here today. She's the author of the book, Lead Beyond Your Title. It's amazing. If you don't have it, you should get it. And in her book, Neely points out many important and valuable points about channeling bravery and passion to discover your own leadership superpowers and to encourage your colleagues and students to use the same. In particular, the quote here on the slide resonates with me. Regardless of your role, keep doing what you're doing and remember to always relentlessly passion up. Well, you know what? This quote really beautifully captures the idea that it's never about the role, and it's always about the goal, and it's always about thinking forward, that you are part of something bigger than yourself, and that together, the best things are possible. If there's one thing that you take from my pitch today, I hope it is that you'll give yourself permission to be brave, and to say what you want to say, and to forge ahead in ways that create an educational culture and climate that is student-centered, and that leads up for all. And in closing, going back to the two questions we started with, what is your why, and what if you don't? Today, you are all my why, and my brave is for you. Now for the second question, what if I didn't do this? I will never know. And that's me being comfortable with being uncomfortable and not knowing. What I do know, though, is that I took the risk, and I showed up ready for anything. We need our students to be like that, too. I decided to be brave enough, hoping I'd make a difference, and to offer something to you and ultimately the students that you serve and inspire. Thank you. Kim, thank you so much. So we have one more inspirational passion picture here today. Um, I know that people are probably getting a little antsy in their seats, need to stretch a little bit, need to use the bathroom, that's okay. Um, over here on the sidelines, we're starting to talk a little bit about adjusting our time for all of our sessions because we will run a little bit late. But um, our first um, introduction here is um, from a special student of Raina's um, to introduce our next presenter. Hi, my name is Jacob Weiner and I'm currently a 7th grader at the Qualtrics Middle School in Mansfield. I had Ms. Friedman as a 5th grade teacher two years ago. I am honored to introduce her as the Passion Pitch Speaker for the Medfield's Designer Learning Day Conference. Raymond Friedman is a 5th grade teacher at the Jordan Jackson Elementary School in Mansfield, Massachusetts. She has taught grades 3 to 5 and is in ITS. She is working on her doctorate degree through Northeastern and hopes to change the field of education someday. Raina is the president of MassQ and has been presenting annual conferences since 2010. She is a Google Level 2 certified educator, a BrainPop certified educator, Flipgrid ambassador, and Fable Vision ambassador. Raina has presented for ISTE, 
ed tech teacher, tech and learning, Medfield Digital Learning Day, FETC, BPLC, and BLC. <laughs> Ms. Freeman is a great teacher and always went out of her way to help us succeed. One example is every Monday and Wednesday she would stay after with us and help us with our, with our homework and studying. We also have to take a state standardized test called MCAS. This became a bit stressful for students, and to make it a lot easier, she woke up and came to school early just to help us for the test. We ate breakfast and had a lot of fun also. One of the best things she gave us was the ability to speak in front of large groups. We had to take a monthly presentation called Discovery Quest and present these to the class. This helped all of her students, including me, succeed. I would like to thank her for all that she did for me. I not only taught people how to swim, ski, kayak, and sail, 
But I also taught people how to love, work together, create masterpieces, and be themselves. Camp showed me that home is where the heart is. I share the third home with the hundreds of students I've seen. We all live in this home. Even you live in this home. The four walls that create the classroom of learning are where growing up, lessons from the heart, and life expectations all join together. Reflecting on what home means to me, I realize that most of my energies are directed toward the growth, love, and support for all of my students. Most of my parents' energies were directed towards the growth, love, and support for me and my sister. The connection startled me. I concluded that the classroom becomes a home away from home for all of our learners. I also concluded that someday we may all end up like our parents, but that's another talk for another day. <laughs> People have always felt welcome in my home and in my classroom. I set up a warm and caring learning environment for all students to succeed. I believe in setting high expectations for students, but telling them at the same time it's okay to make mistakes as long as they try their personal best. I believe in student discovery. Students need to see, hear, taste, feel, and touch for themselves. Students learn better when they experience the world. All I can do is hold their hand and make sure they look both ways before crossing the street. Students need to be part of the classroom community. Being in a community means offering encouragement, celebrating individual differences, talking with each other, and learning in a supportive and trusting place. As a teacher, I need to provide my students with experiences and promote community building. Students need to be shown what respect and responsibility actually mean. They need to take responsibility for their own actions, respect their classmates and teachers, and treat others the way they want to be treated. By being a positive role model, I hope to instill those qualities in my students. I believe that students need to have opportunities to experience their world. They need to face real-world issues, discover current events, and role-play what it's like to be a scientist, a historian, a reader, an author, a mathematician, a singer, an artist, a dancer, and a drama king or queen. These experiences create the bridge between the home and the classroom and the child's home outside the classroom. Students can take these roles with them wherever they go. A home would not be complete without the individuals who reside there. It is these individuals who create the stories which are forever held in the walls of the house. I believe teachers need to meet the needs of the individual learners in their classroom. Attention needs to be given to each student to find out what they know and can do. Using things like the multiple intelligences and assessment tools as guides, teachers can pave an avenue for success. When I walk into an empty classroom, I hear questions from my students. I see eyes wide in amazement as a student discovered an answer to a difficult problem. And I hear the laughter as students work together towards a common goal. When I stroll into an empty bunk at the end of the summer, I hear giggling over the latest crush. I see a shy smile of a boy who I just taught how to tie his shoes. Oh God. <laughs> I feel the warmth of four girls crammed into my tiny bed as I read them a story. When I'm sitting in my house, I feel the plush carpet beneath my feet. I hear the lessons my parents and grandparents taught me. And yes, I was shy at one point. I see a shy little girl whose eyes are wide with amazement and she's ready to take on the world. Truth number two. Many of us have had those philosophical underpinnings from Dewey and Paper that I just shared. We believe in the power of the progressivist approach with constructionism sprinkled in, learn by doing. Except everything I just read to you, I wrote in the spring of 2000, before I even stepped foot in a classroom. All of those images were from that original digital portfolio done in Hyper Studio and HyperCard for anyone that was actually noticing the background. But yet, I could have written it today, which brings me to the lie I told myself a long time ago. Nothing will change, and I am alone on my island. I build a home away from other homes, so where is this bridge? You see, I would bring things to our curriculum team, sorry, and be told to come back in 10 years. 
All right, what's looked at as too progressive risk-taking in those early 2000s, it was lonely. I began to second-guess myself, and my students suffered. That was the shift I needed to have happen for me to start doing what was best for the students in front of me. Through the power of reflecting and questioning, I began to wonder why not has much changed in 20 years for all our students. Trusting myself was the first step in changing. Reading, explaining my why, connecting with others who shared the same vision. These helped me along the journey to find my truth. Is it the fear of change or letting go? Where do you want your students to go? Where do they want to go? Who should they be? Who is in charge of their learning? It took 19 years, but I just did digital portfolios last week, and it was worth every ounce of the weight because our students are our future and they are worth it. Are they consumers of information or creators of their own content? Are they sharing knowledge with you or with an audience? Are they using global communication tools? This is who our students are. They see themselves as an online community and understand the power of how to seek their own answers. They do not need us to tell them the answers. They need us to be sounding boards for their questions. What does this machine do? Can you really play a keyboard with fruit? Who can we communicate with? Inspirational heroes like Kevin Carroll, scientists, authors, other classes. Invite experts into your classroom because we are no longer the experts and need to model that. We don't hold the keys to knowledge but can figure it out with others. They can learn together and we can learn with them. So let them break out, sketch note, and share their thinking through video and audio. Try new things with intention. Connect your class to social media using hashtags. You'll never know what will happen. It is too hard for all of us to keep up with the technology. Our kids need to learn how to communicate clearly through speaking and writing, solve problems, and think creatively and critically. They need to be unafraid of the new technology while understanding the importance of data privacy and security. Let them figure out if they even need to say, OK, Google to get some answers. Because our kids someday are gonna be sitting in offices with no keyboards. Try to create and find spaces in your classroom or school buildings. We now have an innovation station and a STEM classroom. So coming back in 10 years because an idea is too progressive is now a thing of the past. Think long and hard and then go out there and talk to educators in your hallways, administrators who support you, your family, even if they're on Twitter, and your students. They deserve that. In 2000, I did not expect to have a home in an online space, yet Twitter is where I go to run ideas off people. I did not think students, nor I, would be blogging, podcasting, blogging, curating, or creating websites. Collaborating on the same doc was not even an idea yet. We had no Google. Everything is changing around us, so we need to change with it. And remember, have fun and laugh a lot. A good friend of mine, Brian McCann, once said, I'm not asking permission to be awesome, and I'm not apologizing for being passionate. I would like to add to his sentiment, I'll forgive myself when I take a risk and it fails, because my students and I get better that way, and we are truly awesome and passionate together. I hope John Dewey would be proud of me. I turned my lie into a truth. Things are changing. We are changing together. I am not alone. Our students will benefit from all we have to offer them. Share your gifts, build relationships, change the world. Anything is possible when you turn your lies into truths. And there's a picture of my first student connection I met in Boston summer totally randomly. Many thanks to Slides Carnival, Roger Wagner and Hyper Studio, the Medfield DLD team who somehow thought I could do this, my amazing students and colleagues around the world, and Teresa Murphy, Mike Connolly, and John Naracco for believing in me all these years, letting me take risks and being a part of moving Mansfield forward. And now, it's actually Positive Science Thursday.
updates today. So we're going to take a giant DLD Redfield picture. And today's is in 1973, the World Trade Center, then the world's tallest building, opened in New York at 110 stories. Since then, we have chosen love and bravery over fear. Keep choosing love and bravery. We're going to take a picture, but the music's going to play. Thank you. Seating was a production of Medfield TV.